All right, so page 57, we have observation versus experiment. Uh, observation, I mean, the definitions are all here. Um, but basically, I wanted to talk, and, and I'll give you or, or the suggestion that you take some time to read through these uh, definitions carefully on your own. But I'm going to give you a quick overview because uh, some of these things are not as easy to understand as it might seem at first glance. Uh, the, difference, the difference between observation and experiment is that an experiment involves a, a catalyst or some sort of uh, imposed treatment. Whereas an observation is you not interfering in any way, you're just taking note of what's happening based off of a certain set of conditions. Okay, so in, in terms of uh, medicine, it's very easy to see examples that involve uh, experimentation because anytime that you're testing out a new medicine, that is your catalyst. Right? So it's when you're observing something uh, that's occurring perhaps in the world if you can think of something that's happening in the world right now um, that might be uh, related to uh, something that you know you could collect data regarding uh, then then you'd be looking at an observation but if you interfere in some way then you're talking about an experiment observational studies fall into the three categories uh, and really those three categories can be defined uh, you know you've got these lengthy uh, complicated, uh, fancy sounding terms, but really uh, it's present, past, and future. All right. Uh, the present, you know, you're taking measurements uh, at any given moment in time. Uh, anytime you go to the doctor's office and they take your blood pressure, you're part of a cross sectional study. That's at one moment in time. All right. They analyze that metric at that particular moment. Once they compare it to your previous blood pressure, now it becomes a retro retrospective study. So then they give you some medication to control your blood pressure. They're making it an experiment, but they are now looking to see if that changes the future value, which makes it a longitudinal study. And when you're talking about experimental design, you have the obvious things experimental units, subjects, and stuff like that. Not obvious in that you should have known it already, but obvious in that once you read the, the definition, it's like, oh, okay, it makes sense. A treatment is the condition that's applied, and that treatment is going to involve some sort of explanatory variable. That's the input variable, right? So if I apply a treatment, uh, that treatment could be medicine, right? The explanatory variable could be the type of medicine, could be the dosage, could be, um, re oh, well, really, I mean, those are the two basic ideas, but it, if you think about anything else that goes in terms, uh, uh, that is applied to medication, um, that those could be in play, you know? So some medicines you need to take with food, some, some it doesn't matter, you know? So those are some things that you'd want to take into account. Uh, response variable is what you hope to get out of it. Pain relief, lower blood pressure, whatever. Lurking variables are variables, I mean, it says here, that's unaccounted for in the design of your experiment, but also um, variables that come into play, uh, not because you you neglected them, but because you didn't know that they existed to begin with. All right? So, you know, unintended consequences really is what we're talking about here. All right? Confounding, when you have multiple lurking variables and you can't distinguish uh, the effects of the different factors. So the question here, I have my tomato plants. When I ask how did plant E grow to be the largest slash most bountiful, I think it becomes pretty clear because there's a progression that, well, dirt really hardly did anything. Dirt and water allowed a little bit of flowering. Instead of dirt, miracle grow. Uh, gave more size. Same, it looks like a, a, a maybe a smidge more flowering, but more size. Sunlight allowed more flowering and a little bit more blossoming. And then once you throw in the plant food, then all of a sudden your tomato plants take off. All right. So you have, I mean, if you're going from, and I'll just circle them here. If you're going from A to E, uh, I did that backwards. If you're going A to E directly, no idea. It would be confounded.
but A to B to C to D to E, you have a pretty good progression and understanding that the sunlight leads to more greenery, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm not a... I'm, I'm not a farmer or agriculture is. I don't know what the right word is. But, like, I, I don't know this as, as well as some other people would. But it, there, there's more leaves, you know? So sunlight is giving us more leaves, right? As opposed to water giving, uh, I'm sorry, miracle Grow, the miracle Grow so, uh, soil giving us more size. The water itself giving us more flowering, you know? So everything plays a little bit of a different role but it's easier to see what that progression is, all right? So here it's easier to draw conclusions. Now, is there a lurking variable in here? Uh, sure. I didn't say anything about air, I guess. I don't know what the air quality is. Um, pesticides or anything like that. I, I don't There's some other things that could be at work here that are not accounted for. But if I'm saying that all of these things, all of these plants are growing in the same environment and that these are the only things that vary, then it's pretty easy to see what the difference is between the different, uh, the different variables. All right, a placebo is a dummy treatment. So that, that's basically a treatment that doesn't have the active ingredient if you're talking about a medicine. Uh, placebo effect, beneficial effect produced by a placebo drug or treatment that cannot be attri attributed to the properties of the placebo itself because the placebo itself is a dummy treatment and therefore must be due to the patient's belief in that treatment. So, you know, like the whole mind over matter thing and you have um, hope and belief and sometimes, you know, laughter is the best medicine. You know, uh, sometimes a person's belief that they're getting better can that psychological impact can actually cause them to get better you know like the psychosomatic uh, responses and such so what you're dealing with here is some attempt to quantify that right so you give a person a placebo to get a sense of what their belief in getting better would lead to quantifiably and then we compare that to a person who's getting the real medicine because a person who's getting the real medicine would also have the placebo effect because they're like, oh, I'm getting better because I have the real medicine. But then on top of that, they have the active ingredient in the medicine that is, in fact, hopefully helping them to get better. All right. So the placebo effect is something that we want to quantify for comparative purposes. That makes it our baseline, because if you compare a person who takes medication for some whatever it is doesn't matter uh, to somebody who does not take any medication and that that thing that you're measuring has to do with perception there there is that lurking variable of well what is the mind over matter effect you know what is the laughter is the best medicine effect what is the placebo effect we need to quantify that hawthorne effect now, this is more of a sociological. So if you think of placebo effect as psychological, Hawthorne effect is more sociological. You're talking about alteration of behavior in the subjects uh, just by them knowing that they're part of a study. All right. So you know, like uh, the classic example is, uh, it, you know, people working in the factory. It's always a factory, factory workers. They're working hard. They're laboring all day. The boss wants more production out of them, thinks that uh, changing up the music is gonna is gonna get the job done, you know. So uh, they 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 play jazz music on on Wednesdays, and the people are on to it. They know, okay, well, uh, they're playing jazz music on Wednesdays, and people are walking around with clipboards. They know, uh, well, well, they're they're definitely measuring something. So let me let me up my game here. Uh, I have a a better that those are textbook examples. I don't really like those. My my example has to do with just being a teacher. Uh, in the high school, I, I get observed twice a year, right? Um, Keyword observed, uh, based on you know like my level of quality of instruction and so on. Um, it, it's really at this point more for feedback and anything uh, than anything else. You know, like they they rate me on things, but really I just want to know like you know get another set of eyes in the classroom things that I think that I'm doing well, I want to know that I'm actually doing well, you know. 
Uh, at the college, I get observed, I believe, once every two decades, um, or at least that's historically what it's been, but th there's still an observation. So what happens when a person is being observed? You know, you're on your best behavior. Your behavior changes because you know somebody's watching you. All right. That, that's really all there is to it. I mean, if you want a more uh, relatable example, how do you drive normally? How do you drive when, the, when you know the cops are out? All right. That's the Hawthorne effect. All right. Um, blinding. Subject knows or does not know if he or she is receiving a treatment or a placebo. That's kind of important if you're asking a person's opinion on whether or not they're feeling better after receiving some medicine. Hey, how you feeling? Uh, pretty lousy, actually. You gave me a placebo. Okay. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. You gave me the good stuff. You know, so that's a possibility. Double blinding sounds weird because it doesn't seem like a, a person would necessarily find value in this. But when the administrator is also measuring based off of perception, whether or not a person's improving or not, uh, based off of um, uh, the, the medication or whatever it is, uh, we want to eliminate their perception as much as possible also. So the hierarchy ends up being that you have the physician uh, or the, the, the person uh, running the show, the researcher. You know, I have the diagram here, but basically you, you got the person running the whole show, then another professional that's administering the test, but they don't have any knowledge of who's getting what, right? So they know some patients are getting a, a placebo and some patients are getting the, uh, the actual medicine but the pills look exactly the same. All they're given is a cup with a pill in it and a name. And they're just told, give this medicine to a, to a person and just walk around with a clipboard and observe, uh, observe what you observe, right? And just write next to the, pa the patient's name what you observe and then report all that back to the, the, the researcher who has the master list of who got what, right? That's the double blinding. All right. So it, like, with that in mind, there would never be anything in that in that scenario. There wouldn't be triple blinding because you do need somebody who knows who got what. But that person is taking themselves out of the equation so that they're not influenced by knowing that this person got the placebo. Oh, this person, Charlie, he looks like he's getting a lot better. Oh, uh, yeah, but he got the placebo. So that can't be right. You know, so they, they want to make sure that they they're not uh, allowing for that sort of thing to happen. Exploratory data analysis, very straightforward. You don't know what you're looking for. You are interested in the topic, and so you're collecting data to see what's going on. The formal statistical inf inference can go either way. Maybe you have an idea, you have specific questions that you'd like answers to, but you don't know definitively one way or the other necessarily. I mean, you have a belief or a claim, but you don't know necessarily which way it's going to play out. So you start off with exploratory data analysis, but then once your data starts leading you in a particular direction, you then try to prove or disprove based off of that data. All right. Um, that, that's a lot of the basis of what we're going to be working with moving forward, but it, it's, it's very powerful stuff. But you, you go into it with an open mind because some people go into... Uh, statistical analyses looking to prove a particular outcome and then they try to force the data to, to prove that outcome for them and that that's disingenuous and uh, people like me and uh, in a couple of weeks you will be able to see right through their uh, their BS uh, sampling error error that results in the survey process due to non-responsive individuals selected and accurate responses and so on uh, basically, all that's telling us is that when you get that phone call or email or whatever asking you to complete a survey and you say, nope, not doing it, you're creating sampling error. So, great. Good job. It all depends on who, uh, what, or what entity is performing the study. Sometimes I get so aggravated with the fact that everybody seems to want to have you complete a survey after you purchase something on Amazon, after you go to a doctor's office, 
it doesn't really matter. You buy a car. Everybody wants you to complete a survey. And it's like, enough of the surveys. I don't want to do it anymore. Everybody thinks that the answer to everything is a survey. Um, and, and sometimes it's tied to dollars. You know, like, you want to talk about skewed outcomes. And I, mean, I bought a car. I mean, and I'm sure many of us have been in this situation. You buy a car, you complete the sale, you're happy, you're, you're about to get in the car, and the salesman tells you, well, you're going to get a survey in the mail, or you're going to get a survey on the phone or online, or somebody's going to call. It, it doesn't matter. Complete it. And then they go one step further. They tell you what to put down. They're like, listen, if you got any problems, call me. Don't put anything less than a 10 down on the survey because that affects my salary. Talk about the ultimate guilt trip. Now, I'd like to think I wouldn't have bought the car if I wasn't completely satisfied. However, adding that little extra component there, it doesn't make anybody happy about anything. And it's the same thing when you, uh, when you get your car serviced. And everybody wants you to fill out a survey. So when you don't participate in that, you are non-responsive and therefore creating sampling error. And sometimes I just do that for fun. The non-sampling error has to do with incorrect collection of the data, the human error part of it. That's a little bit more straightforward. You know, and, and sometimes human error is on purpose, which sucks because there are liars out there. But you know, somebody's surveying you and they ask you, uh, what's what's your your zip code? And you say 10595. And they write 10559. It happens. What can you do? You know, uh, it's an honest error and, and that, that can be, uh, that can happen, you know, and when that happens, you, you, you gotta just hope for the best and that it doesn't screw up the entire study. But, uh, but that's why you cross the T's and dot the I's, you double check everything. The types of sampling, we have anecdotal evidence. Uh, we, we talk as humans, we talk in terms of anecdotal evidence all the time. My friend told me this, I saw on Facebook that, I read this article. And you wouldn't think reading articles would necessarily be anecdotal evidence, but more and more, it, it actually is that, especially since, you know, like you identify uh, based off of your opinions, political affiliations and so on. And then articles uh, in, in newspapers, journals, magazines, they're curated and sent to you based off of your previous perceptions. And right? so it becomes anecdotal. So you're not getting the full picture. But the example I gave was um, uh, polling your friends on their opinion on smoking on school grounds. Um, I'll take it as a typo. I've been meaning to fix this for a while or update it. Uh, smoking or vaping on school grounds. Um, yeah, just because. No, I don't. I don't think it adds anything to the the lesson, but I think it's it's just more updated. So the first person to submit that that hasn't already met the uh, requirement of three typo bonus points will receive a bonus point. Um, yeah. So basically, I mean, what you're looking at is the idea that your friends could not possibly be representative of the entire population. So you can't draw conclusions that nobody wants people to smoke on school grounds. Because your five friends, not to say that you only have five friends, but the five friends that you polled don't want people smoking on school grounds because what, in what way are they representative of the population? Especially if you and those five friends are sitting around smoking cigarettes on school grounds while having this conversation. Right? Available data could be fine. In the past, data was used to answer someone else's question, but could also be used for your study. I do this all the time. It's not plagiarism unless you use someone else's data that answers their question to answer your question that is the same as their question. All right, so basically you're reproducing their study. Then it's plagiarism. But if somebody produced a study on, uh, I'll, I'll keep it simple. I like football, so I'll say that Eli Manning is the worst quarterback to ever win the Super Bowl. And they have data for all the quarterbacks who have won the Super Bowl. Eli Manning's data is in there, all right? And I, I can go a couple of different ways here because I'm a Giants fan. I might say Eli Manning 
is not, simply not the worst quarterback to ever win the Super Bowl. Or I could choose a different quarterback. Or I could I could find a, a statistic that I like. I could say, maybe I'm not talking about, maybe this individual who ran the study was talking about passing, passing yards. Maybe I want a touchdown uh, to interception ratio, a number of sacks, you know, like some other piece of data that was used in this individual study. And I just want to use it in a different capacity. All right. Random samples are the hallmark of any good experiment or observational study. Those random samples need to be representative, though. Otherwise, you're skewing your data and your results will be, at best, questionable, at worst, completely um, nonsensical. All right. And so in this day and age, people are getting away with a lot of... Um, it, 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 they don't even falsify the data. It's just that the data is not representative because they they handpicked individuals to be in their study or they just flat out disregarded opinions of people that they didn't like. All right? So a simple random sample is you throw every name in the, of, of the, per, the people in the population in the hat and draw X number, N number of individuals at random, and there you go. Blocking is just a term to talk about individuals that are similar, right? So, you know, you think about, I mean, this is an election year. It, I guess every year is an election year, but a presidential election year. So blocking could be blocking by party. You know, Democratic National Convention, that's an automatic block. Anybody who's involved in that would be a Democrat, all right? If, you, if you're talking about um, the Republican Party, or, you know, like if you want to get into... Um, people who forget about party, people who typically vote for the incumbent, because that's a thing. I didn't even know about that till I started studying this. There are people who always vote for the incumbent, and there are people who always vote against the incumbent, regardless of political affiliation. And there, the rationale, or at least the psychology behind it, is. Well, I've seen what you can do, and you're no good, so let's get someone else in there, all right? So anyway, uh, randomized block design is uh, carrying that the next step. You create blocks and then randomly assign treatments to the individuals within the blocks, all right? So if I wanted to, I'll use gender, for example. I have a sample of individuals. I break them up by gender because there are situations or medications or uh, uh, maladies that impact genders, age groups differently from one another. And I wanna make sure that this blood pressure medicine, for example, will have the same impact on females as it does males, or at least at a minimum, I wanna know what the impact will be. So I break them up into males and females and uh, the non-binary individuals and then I break those individuals up into a control and experimental group, assign the treatment, assign the placebo, and then compare the results. And then from there, I can compare from the two different groups. Stratified random sample is a similar idea, except what you're doing is once you break the individuals up into, into different blocks, or in this case, we call them strata, what we do is we take a simple random sample from within each group and then put those simple random samples together to form another group. All right, so that ends up being, if I could actually draw a line, that ends up being your sample. All right. So you have the population of students and let's say high school students and you want to um, I, I mean, you could do a bunch of, you could do this a bunch of different ways, but let's say you want to create a student government, but you want it to have uh, equal representation, but you want to do it randomly for some reason. I don't know. You know, I didn't really think this example through, but you would break them up into the natural blocks or strata, freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors, and maybe grab 10 students from each age group or each category then put them all together and you have a sample size 40, it guarantees equal representation from each group. 
All right. Uh, this is uh, for me. This is my default when I can't when I when it's not feasible to use a simple random sample because it's too complicated, and uh, and I can't think of any other way to do it. I usually go with a stratified systematic sample. That's when you select the kth every kth individual from the population. I, I, this one you got to kind of imagine, but you take everybody in our class. 30 whatever people, line them up, and you have them count off, right? Count off, um, let's see, there's 30 people, so we'll say five. So one, two, three, four, five, 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 until you have every, every person accounted for. Then all the ones get in a group, all the twos get in a group, all the threes get in a group, all the fours get in a group, all the fives and all the sixes. Um, well, actually, just the fives. So that would be an example of a systematic sample. I'm sure everybody's been in a situation where that's happened, whether it's been in sports, whether, you know, any number of possibilities. Just count off, and you're supposed to know what that means. Cluster sample is if you were to go back to the idea of the systematic, uh, I'm sorry, the stratified sample, you have your entire sample that's based off of simple random samples from each stratum which are obtained from the population so you have these three these four strata now what a cluster sampling is telling us to do is once you break them up into the groups just grab an entire group all right so we're not sampling from within each group it's i have freshmen sophomores juniors and seniors give me all the juniors all right, so you have, in the case of the cluster sample, uh, an entire student body that's in the gym for a pep rally, and they, they just want to do a little recognition. You know, the, the junior class made some sort of achievement. Maybe they won the homecoming weekend, you know, and it's like, okay, uh, we want to give a round of applause to the junior class. Everybody in the junior class, please stand up. Junior class stands up, they get a nice round of applause. That's a cluster sample, all right? The whole school is broken up into the different categories and they selected one, not at random though, so that's the only difference there. Um, but that's the idea. Convenience sampling, I think that's kind of a non-starter because that's just talking about samples that are easily uh, obtained. Uh, that, you know, it could be good or bad if it was easily obtained, but you violated some of the rules that we're kind of establishing here, then, then it's not good. But if it's convenient sampling because you used available data correctly, then that, that's a good thing. So it's debatable. Match pairs, you have one sample, two measurements are taken. Um, in the case of match pairs, it's pretty easy to, to, to identify. It's just a before and after, you know, like, I want to make a determination of whether or not this training regimen that I'm uh, using is going to improve my one mile time. You know, so uh, I, I do a baseline. I, I run one mile. You know, maybe I do it over a course of a week, eat one, one time each day when I'm well rested, same time of day, same conditions. And then I take the average time it takes to complete one mile, get that number, and then I participate in the training regimen. And then after that, over the course of a week, I get same time of day, same conditions, the time it takes to run one mile and compare those values before and after. All right. But I don't just do it for me. I have my brother Fred doing it. I have my friend Mike doing it. I have my other friend Mike doing it. I have my other friend Mike doing it and my other friend Mike doing it. Um, I, I grew up in the 90s, as I've mentioned in previous videos. So I have a lot of friends named Mike. So um, so that that's something. Um, so yeah, that, that'll be, you know what I'll do? In a future video, I'm gonna ask a question and it's gonna be related to this very moment. And, uh, and that'll be an Easter egg. I'm going to make an Easter egg in this moment that I'm going to pay off in a future video. How about that? All right. So that's my before and after example. 
all right? The voluntary response sample is your self-selection. Anybody who thinks anything conclusive or meaningful comes from a voluntary response sample is horribly misguided because really when you think about it, voluntary is the key word there. The only people that want to part, uh, the only people that participate in this voluntary response sample are people who want to. So if I went to uh, a website, a political website, and I saw a study there, I saw one of those polls saying, do you think this is fake news? Do you think that uh, politician is great or otherwise, whatever? Just by the virtue of me participating in that without being directed to, I am now part of a voluntary response sample. Everybody else who did it were also part of a voluntary response sample, so therefore the data is skewed. All right, because the only people who would want to participate in that are people who would be interested in participating in that. Um, a good example of this uh, would be the, uh, the, the course evaluation surveys uh, at the college that we all do. So what we end up doing is generally mandating that our students participate in these studies because in the past, when, when it first went over to electronic delivery, it used to be, you know, take some time out in class, you'd have some bubble sheets, you'd have somebody come in and actually administer it for you. Um, and then a student would collect it and, and send it to the powers that be and so on. Uh, once it went over to the electronic system, what happened was it became voluntary. It was complete this survey, please. And so the only people that would complete the survey would be people who either loved the teacher or absolutely hated the teacher. So what happened? Not much. We weren't able to get some meaningful, any meaningful information out of it. It's kind of like uh, ratemyprofessor.com. If you ever see a lukewarm or just a, a right down the middle analysis of a teacher on Rate My Professor, uh, it, well, let me know because it's news to me. It's usually best teacher I've ever had or worst teacher I've ever had. The only exception to that would be he or she is not as bad as the other posts on this say that he or she is, right? But all of that is voluntary, right? The only time it's not voluntary is when you are being directed to participate in it. Um, and, and, and even then there's an element of voluntary or voluntarism that, that come into play. But Generally, if you're the one seeking out the study to be part of, you're, you're part of a voluntary response sample and you are automatically skewing the information all right, and the results of the study. So basically, those outcomes are completely meaningless. The next part of this, it, 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 it deserves its own video. So page 60, the process for conducting an observation um, and experiment. I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do that, uh, like I said, in another video because I don't want this one to be too overwhelming. And also, you do need some time to digest everything that we've gone over because you do need to have a firm grasp on that before you could have a hope of understanding something like this and things uh, related.